So good evening and welcome. My name is Danielle Adevito and I'm a reference librarian at the Guilford Free Library. Our talk tonight is TikTok, but not the app your kids are obsessed with, with Scott Williams. We are happy to co-sponsor this program with the Guilford Conservation Commission. We welcome your questions at the end of the talk. Um, please use the Q&A tool and Kevin McGee will answer your questions. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Janet Ainsworth, Chair of the Guilford Conservation Commission. So oh, hi everybody, and I'm so glad you're joining us. I'm actually pretty excited for this talk. I first heard Scott do this talk for the North Branford Land Trust some years ago. And although I have had no ticks on me so far this year, knock on wood, it's, it's a topic of great interest to just about everybody I talk to. Um, so this is one in the occasional series of educational programs that our commission does. And uh, we're so lucky to have not only know Scott, but Scott's a member of our commission. And so he agreed to do this presentation for us as part of our program of educational uh, seminars usually, but this, this is a webinar. So um, Scott's background was on the website, but just to go over uh, quickly, he has a BA from Connecticut College, master's from Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and a PhD from the University of Connecticut. He is employed at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station working on tick and host ecology to better public health. He and his family live in Southern North Guilford on County Road, a literal stone's throw from North Branford. And since I've stopped there from time to time to exchange information with Scott's wife, uh, who's uh, involved with the land trust, as am I, um, it's a Nice spot, and it is almost in North Bradford. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Scott. Okay, thank you. You, you guys can hear me and we're good? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. let me uh, share my screen here. Thank you for the introduction. Um, we're good with the shared screen here. Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, my talk here tonight, it was, uh, it's the scientific title, technical title, is Suppression of Vector Tick Populations in the Suburban Landscape Through Integrated Use of Host-Targeted and Non-Host-Targeted Tick Control Measures. So that's a, a title to make me sound smart and like I know what I'm talking about. Um, and this is um, a joint project we're doing actually here in the town of Guilford that we've been wrapping up. This is the fifth year of it with my colleagues, Dr. St Kirby Stafford and Megan Linsky, whose um, parents and in-laws uh, grew up and currently live here in Guilford. And um, we have assistance from our techs and research assistants, Michael Short, Heidi Stewart, and Jamie Cantoni. And this is um, work USDA funded project. We've done at um, the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that entails and what host targeted versus non host targeted and such means. Um, <clears throat> and I'll get into a bit about tick ecology and pathogen ecology. And, um, and maybe toward the end, I'm sure we'll have some questions about new invaders and new ticks and other diseases of concern and so forth. Um, but hopefully, you'll we'll glean some stuff um, between now and then. Um, but the, the focus of this talk is going to be on control of the black-legged tick or the deer tick, Ixodes scapularis, which is um, our most abundant tick, most abundant tick of concern here in Connecticut um, for pathogen transmission purposes and the one we should be worrying about the most. Um, but with this, I'm in with the tick ecology and the pathogen ecology, and that's what interests me. And here you can see, um, you know, uh, let me get my pointer here. Um, here we have rodents, which play a role in the pathogen and tick transmission and tick life cycle. Deer, which also play a role in the tick life cycle. Um, of course, the ticks themselves. Here you see myself on our mobile lab at the back of a pickup truck, and my colleague Mike Short sampling the ticks here. But so less. Um, well, this is TikTok by 
when I told my daughter about this, my 18 year old, she said, dad, that's such a dad joke. So my talk is, has a few corny dad jokes in it and they're going to fall flat because I don't have an audience to gauge my stupid corniness because I'm just talking to my screen. But anyhow, um, I told her she, I've been doing TikToks for over a decade and she thought that was pretty funny, but until she didn't anymore. Anyhow, um, of course, with the black legged ticks or deer ticks, the, the biggest um, threat and disease of concern is Lyme disease. And here um, you can see this graph here is proposed from 1998 to 2018, which was the most recent data I could find, but you see this um, exponentially rising um, reported cases in the country and only about 10% of cases are reported. So while it's somewhere around 40,000 cases, it's more like 400 um, actual cases nationwide. And here in this map to the right, you can see, you know, these blue dots, there's one for every county in which the case of Lyme disease occurred. Massachusetts has a funky reporting rate. So you can just assume that Massachusetts is all blue as well. But you can see, um, you know, Southern New England, up through coastal Maine, mid-Atlantic and the uh, upper Midwest are, are, are focal points for um, Lyme disease. And it's only spreading northward through Southern Canada and, um, and southward through the Appalachians as well. And this image here is Borrelia burgdorferi. This is the spirochete, um, the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So ticks don't carry Lyme disease, ticks carry this pathogen um, that they obtain from mice and other small rodents when they feed. And then when they feed on us, they give us this pathogen and insert it into our blood system, which then creates Lyme disease um, in our system. So we get the pathogen that gives us Lyme disease. We don't get Lyme disease from ticks directly, if that makes sense. Um, another one of concern is Babesia mycorrhizae. Babesiosis is the disease in humans, and that's caused by um, the um, pathogen Babesia microti, which is a protozoa versus a bacteria. So that comes with a different, you can't use antibiotics on that. You need to use like an anti-malarial um, drug on that. And this one's becoming of increasing concern. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Similar rise in cases of Babesiosis, um, not as many, but it's become, it's something we're keeping an eye on. The same distribution pattern here, southern New England, um, coastal Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, upper Midwest. So the, we're, we're, this is kind of on the heels of Lyme disease and following that same um, distribution pattern. And anaplasmosis is caused by the pathogen Anaplasma phagocytophilum. Again, we're seeing this exponential growth curve of cases reported. So again, not as many as Lyme disease, but both anaplasmosis and babesiosis cases are of concern and following that same trend. Um, so something to watch, something we're keeping an eye on and pertinent to Guilford, and I will get to that a little bit later in the talk. Um, but for those of you who aren't aware, there's um, multiple stages of our black legged tick. So this is probably the one that a lot of you are most familiar with. This is the adult female black legged tick that's active in um, early spring and um, fall and early winter. And these are um, the adults and the eggs are laid. Let's see, starting in here, eggs are laid about this time of year. And they hatch out as larvae, these tiny little specks that just look like a glisten on your skin um, that hatch in August for the most part. And then they hang around very low to the ground and, and basically latch on to whatever host comes by, whether it be a, a, a ground dwelling bird or a squirrel or a human or a dog or a fox or a deer, whatever. They're not specific. Um, whatever they can latch onto and get a blood meal from. And once they get a blood meal, they fall off. And they go around this little, this little um, swirl here and they become, they molt and they become nymphs, which are very, very small. Like the period at the end of the sentence that we're just getting over that nymphal peak right now. Um, so when you see a tiny, tiny little one on you in May and June, that's this nymphal stage of black-legged tick. It's not a 
different species. It's just a different stage of the black-legged tick. And then this nymph, like I said, becomes active in May and June, seeks a host, and it finds same cohort of hosts, medium-sized mammals, small mammals, large mammals, what have you, not specific. Um, and then it gets a blood meal, it molts, becomes an adult, and then the adult female then looks for a, um, a host. And these guys do have a size requirement. The adult females require larger animals like medium-sized mammals to deer and will not feed on birds and smaller rodents. So the adult males do not feed, but they will find a female on these larger hosts and mate and the males then die and the females engorged with blood, fall off, lay eggs and the whole two year cycle begins. So, um, so we can use this to our advantage in treating ticks um, if, if you understand the life cycle and understand what um, stage of ticks is on what host when. And I will talk to you about that a little bit in our strategy here. And, um, that's pretty well known and we can be very targeted in our control of these guys on these various hosts um, as the season progresses. And the Borrelia burgdorferi, this is the pathogen that causes Lyme disease, is a, the transmission cycles um, occurs alongside with the tick life cycle, but the um, Borrelia is found, as I mentioned, in mice and small rodents. So when the um, larvae are hatched and born. They're uninfected. They don't have any pathogens in them. For the very, I mean, with very few exceptions. You can essentially say they're uninfected with any of these pathogens. But when they feed on these rodents and small mammals, um, there's the opportunity to uptake these various pathogens I mentioned into their system and become infected themselves. So then they get the blood meal and, and they molt into nymphs and about 25% of our nymphs are infected with this Borrelia burgdorferi specifically. And then they molt and then they have, um, sorry, they feed again and they have an opportunity with which to either infect uninfected rodents with the pathogen they're carrying or become infected themselves in their second blood meal and they become adults and the adult females have, you know, 40 to 50% infection with this pathogen because they've had two blood meals with which um, to, to uptake the pathogen. And then, um, then the adult female feeds on these, you know, larger mammals and deer, um, while they play a role in the life cycle, do not play a life cycle of the tick, do not play a role in the various pathogen transmission cycle. So deer are pivotal, in life stages, but not so much in the pathogen. So that's a little background. I, I know there's often questions and in this format, I, I apologize. I, I can't answer your questions, but um, hopefully you, you've gotten that. And if you have questions afterwards, um, feel free to ask. But suffice to say where you have a lot of deer, you're gonna have a lot of ticks, but where you have a situation like that, not as many of the ticks are going to be infected. Um, but where you have fewer deer, you're going to have fewer ticks, but because the ticks are feeding on small rodents, you're going to have a higher infection percentage um, of those on the landscape, if that makes sense. So when we want to treat ticks, and we want to kill them in people's backyards in the interest of public health, um, we go through an integrated approach, and there isn't just because the feeding and pathogen cycles are, are, are fairly complex, there's no like one place we can go to target these things. So we have to target them at multiple stages and multiple, um, on multiple hosts, understanding that ecology when best to target them. So some of the tools in the toolbox of integrated tick management are education and behavior change, which hopefully you'll take some away from this today, just understanding the tick and tick life cycle and understanding what and when to look for instead of just running into the house and getting out of the woods, but rather understanding what's going on out there. Um, personal protection measures, which could be something as simple as the second image down is tucking your socks into your pants when you're in tick habitat. So, um, you know, they're crawling, they're not crawling up your pant legs, not to your skin directly, that you're, they're coming up your clothing and to your upper body, where hopefully you're going to detect them more easily. Um, to um, 
uh, permethrin treated clothing, which I bought for my crew, um, which permethrin is both a repellent and in the caricide, meaning it'll kill the ticks ultimately, um, to um, just put it on light clothing or, or something of that nature. Landscape modifications, you can see in the top right picture, this wood chip barrier can keep ticks from migrating from the woods into your lawn because they have a tendency to dry out. This wood chip barrier is like the desert where the sun's beating down and they're gonna dry out and die if they try to cross that. Um, and there's other stuff, invasive control and some other things you could do for landscape modification. There's chemical control, there's synthetic insecticides. There's botanicals or natural compounds that don't necessarily kill the tick, but repel it. Repel them from your property and, and can keep them off um, until the next season. And people you know, seem okay with that. And that seems to work for folks. Biological control, there's host reduction or, or, or hunting or deer reduction um, or exclusion using fencing to keep them out. And um, then there's host targeted the caricides, which I'm gonna talk about today, which means you can treat the deer or the mice with um, and the caricide, which is a pesticide that kills ticks. Um, or there's host targeted vaccines that you can feed the tick, the mice or the deer, and um, it, it can either impact the pathogen or kill the ticks on them as well. So today we're gonna to talk about some chemical control and some synthetic insecticides we're going to talk a little bit about biological control and host targeted the caricide. So this is the integrated strategy we use here in Guilford for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, the theory of management behind ticks and tick-borne diseases is this triad that consists of vector, which is the tick, um, and the pathogen, which resides in the host, and the tick then feeds upon the host and then vectors the pathogen to other hosts. So it's, we can attack the pathogen, we can attack the vector, or we can attack the host in an effort to in interrupt this transmission cycle. And there's a whole variety of ways here we can do that. But in, in this project here, we're focusing on the vector, which is the tick, and we're focusing on, on tick reduction and hopefully pathogen reduction in a variety of different strategies that I'll get into. Um, one is the device is called the four poster. And when normal people think of a four poster, they think of a four post bed like this, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is this, this device here. Um, it's called a four poster there. You can see my backside and <laughs> you can see my colleague, Mike here. Um, servicing this four poster. So in this hopper here is corn, whole corn that we put in in 50 pound bags. And then you see one, two, three, four posts, hence the name. And these paint rollers here that sit, they're on spring loaded posts. And there's a trough here that's open and a little bit of corn trickles out of this bin into this trough and is accessible there. And my colleague Mike is putting um, a caricide or a pesticide on the rollers here that soaks in. So when the deer come to feed, hopefully they lean against these things and get that pesticide on them and they groom it through their body and hopefully it kills the ticks on them. Um, and I've got a ton of different images here. So this is host targeted, meaning the deer is the host for the tick and we're targeting the ticks on the host with this four poster device. Um, so I've already gone through this and those stuff, and there's only one chemical of permethrin that's labeled for use in this um, capacity. And um, it does a pretty good job, but it's topical. It stays on the deer on, the, on their skin and on their fur and doesn't get ingested necessarily um, into the muscle tissue or anything. So it's just, it's just a topical treatment. Um, and we're, and as I mentioned, you know, the majority of female adult ticks require a blood meal from deer. So we know when the ticks are going to be on the deer um, and we shoot to interrupt the life cycle at that point. This picture was taken in June. This is just demonstration and we're doing this for Lone Star ticks, which have a different activity cycle, which is uh, May, June, July. So that's why we're servicing this back in 2018. So here you can see images of deer feeding on this. So they're both here feeding on this trough and because the trough is oriented the way it is adjacent to these paint rollers, 
you know, the goal is for deer to make contact with these rollers as they're feeding on here. Um, so this is great here. So we have this doe, uh, you can see her rubbing right up on those four, those rollers there as she's getting into the um, corn. And, and presumably, you know, the, the active ingredient on there is getting all over her. And um, most of the ticks, um, black legged lone stars, what have you, typically feed on the ears and the and the upper body of the animals. So so they're directly rolling this pesticide right on them. And then we have this, you know, yearling buck here who's just sticking his head right between them like a good boy and getting his getting his full dose right there. So this is just ideal, and this is the intent of these devices is and these deer are cooperative and, and, and doing their thing. Um, but there's some uh, other things that, you know, here in this animal, we can see that it's likely this device is empty and she keeps on kicking it and moving it and she can smell the corn and just, just moving it all around. So ultimately when they, when they're not full of corn, um, they molest them to the point where they knock them over and then we have to come service them and put corn in and, and treat them. But they they get pretty aggressive with them. And, um, and uh, and moving around quite a bit, but then we have um, it, we have a but a food source out there. You have non-target animals that you um, need to consider as well. Here are a bunch of grackles and, and squirrels. It looks like that are gorging themselves on the you know corn that's freely available, but not necessarily getting treated with the um, active ingredient because they're small enough where they can just jump in and jump right out jump in and jump out, jump right in and jump right out again. And just, so these guys are obviously bypassing the, um, you know, the engineering component, the component of the, of the device and not necessarily getting treated. So this is just something we've had to contend with. Um, turkeys too, turkeys sure are host for ticks, but their heads and necks are so slender, they can just pop, pop right in and, and grab the corn without being treated themselves. So then we have interspecific, interspecific meaning between species issues here. You can see a raccoon um, on the sort of dominating the device and leaning right up against the, the roller and presumably getting treated with chemical. And then this, this doe comes in and looks at her and the raccoon postures and angrily in defense and, and it prevents this doe covered in ticks from from feeding and um, sort of defeats the purpose of the device. So here again, this is at our Lone Star site down in Norwalk. And I know I blew it up a little bit, but these are all engorged ticks on the ears and on the bare part of its neck where the collar has rubbed some of the fur off. Those are just um, a ton of Lone Star ticks on this poor animal. But this is the first year of this Lone Star project which is a separate project that I'm talking about today, but we were successful in substantially reducing the numbers of Lone Star. So this was, uh, the deer don't look like this anymore down there. They're only got a handful on them. Um, and then we have interspecific dominance issues like this squirrel taking on the deer and preventing her from, from getting in and feeding directly. Kind of an action shot, kind of comical. Um, but then some of the, uh, of more concern, you know, is some of the intraspecific intra dominance issues where you have the deer keeping other deer away from the feeders. Deer have a, a hierarchical social structure where um, they're dominant, both does and bucks that um, keep the others at bay. So um, when you have a permanent food source like this, there can be issues arise where um, deer can keep other deer from coming into feed and getting treated, which limits the effectiveness of these devices for sure. So here you can see, you know, Mama Doe over here. This is an aggressive posture with her ears back, and she's coming at this this younger doe is probably a niece or, or a daughter, and chasing her off the device, which is not not ideal. Um, ideally, we'd like to have both of these animals feeding together on either end, getting treated. Um, and you have your classic big buck here. This is just south of Timberlands, actually here in Guilford. Um, and these big bucks have the potential to drive other subordinate bucks or other um, does away just by their um, dominant personalities generally. 
Um, and here again, you can see this is a definite dominant um, posturing here with this doe and her, she's striking at this animal feeding, ears pinned back and trying to keep this animal from her food source. So this was in December um, when we were putting the devices out without the paint rollers on so they'd get used to them and understand what they were. Um, but clearly, you know, at midnight, this, this doe is not trying to dominate this animal and, and keep them away from her food source. So there's those issues we have to contend with. So that was the four poster that treats deer. And then another host targeted um, system is this rodent targeted bait box, which is essentially that same system, but just on a smaller scale. So these bait boxes here um, use a different compound, fipronil, which is the act active ingredient in frontline. Um, like you give your dogs and your, in, um, in your pets, but a much, much lower dose. So um, we can kill the juvenile ticks on rodents and interrupt um, um, that life cycle and path pathogen transmission cycle because the rodents are the reservoir for the various pathogens. Again, same concept as we just saw with that four poster, just on a smaller scale. Um, so the rodents have these ticks feeding on them. And this is the cutaway. There's these two non-toxic bait blocks within the body of these bait boxes. Um, and then the mice can come, it doesn't kill them and it isn't poisonous. The mice and chipmunks can come and go as they please. And as they come in and enter the box, they have to go through this wick here that is soaked in, in fipronil. So as they come to access the bait, they get dosed with, um, that active ingredient in frontline and instead of propagating ticks thereafter, any tick that adheres to them and tries to feed then in theory is killed and falls off. So, um, you know, the host targeted measure targeting adults in the deer is limiting um, reproductive capacity of the ticks. And here it's killing the juvenile ticks, which tend to be more numerous, but also tend to be um, more implicated in the very pathogen transmission cycle. So here we're killing ticks and hopefully interrupting that pathogen um, life cycle versus the four poster. We're, we're pretty much just killing ticks. So this is sort of a double whammy here. And we want to spread these out um, on the periphery of the lawn, woodland edge. And that's what we did here in Guilford in our project. And this is where the majority of ticks are found is this edge habitat where the mice and a deer and other critters reside. And, and we put them out here um, and we would nail them to the ground and with zip ties to prevent raccoons and stuff from relocating them. And um, this system has been successful. It's fairly expensive, but um, it's successful not only in reducing the nymphal cohort of the deer black legged ticks, but also the infected population can go down over time. So this is the second tool in our toolbox that we used um, in addition to the four poster. And the third tool used in this integrated approach was Metarizia manisopheli, which is a naturally occurring soil borne fungus. Um, so this fun we spray this fungus out there and the, the fungus adheres to anything with a cuticle like you can see here. And it's very specific to ticks with this cuticle. And um, once it adheres to it, it replicates and um, the, they germinate in the hyphae or the, the roots for lack of a better term of the fungus penetrate into the tick and de develops internally within the tick and ultimately overwhelms the tick and kills it. So this is, um, much more selective than synthetics that kill anything from honeybees to butterflies to ladybugs to other beneficial insects. And this is very specific to um, arachnids with a cuticle. And if we're spraying it at that lawn woodland periphery, we can be much more selective, um, you know, because that's the area where these, these ticks thrive and the majority are found. So this is virtually organic. Um, it goes on, it falls into the trade name MET52. It would be get organic, except they had to add petroleum distillates to the formulation to keep the spores in suspension. It's often used in the greenhouse industry. Um, and we published multiple papers on its effectiveness um, at the ag station. Here's one I, I, I did on a, on a previous integrated program we did. Um, but unfortunately, there's a limited market for this and production is challenging and it's 
virtually impossible to get it out. And I'm not sure they're going to be making this into the future, which is kind of unfortunate because it really served this purpose. Um, so we've done quite a bit of integrated pest management and controlling ticks and tick associated diseases, as you can see here by Kirby, myself and Dr. Malai's joint publication um, from several years ago. And here are various projects we've done um, in the past and some future studies we're not, we're not necessarily directly involved with, but they happen here in tick country, New Jersey, Maryland, Connecticut, throughout, you know, that, that focal point for Lyme disease that I showed you in that map previously. But um, this is the one we're gonna talk about. And this is the one that's been happening in Connecticut. This is the USDA funded one that started in 2017. And is, we're in our final year of now, and not only Connecticut, but here at Guilford. And we're doing this with our Maryland counterparts and um, we're duplicating what they're doing down there as a, um, as a duplicate study. So it's, we all know where Guilford is. It's right here, South Central Connecticut. Um, and this is with all the crew I mentioned previously. And we have identified seven neighborhoods throughout town with these various um, treatment um, combinations. So we have neighborhood one has bait boxes in the MET 52 spray. Two has the four poster and bait box combination. Neighborhood three has all three in combination. And then we duplicate that. Neighborhood four has four poster bait box. Neighborhood five is our control or we did no treatment. And then neighborhood six is all three. And uh, neighborhood seven has bait box met, met 52. So there's two neighborhoods with bait, bait box met 52, two neighborhoods with bait box four poster and two neighborhoods with all three. So um, those three are replicated. And we had a number of 83 houses in total where we were sampling ticks and then um, where we were sampling rodents and treating for ticks directly was nine properties when each, within each of those seven neighborhoods for a total of 63. So in the summer of 2017, it was our baseline year. We just trapped rodents and, and sampled ticks just to see what we were dealing with initially. And then we deployed four posters in the fall and the spring of 2018. Spring 2018, 1920, and fall 2018, fall 2019, and fall 2020, um, corresponding to the deer take activity cycle. Um, and then we did, you know, bait box distribution and Met 52 spraying, um, along with the uh, with the proper um, timing. I apologize, my dog is barking in the background. Um, and the neighborhoods we chose were um, distributed throughout town. We were looking for cul-de-sacs in areas where we could work without having to deal with traffic and so forth. Um, and they were randomly assigned and we were looking to work in neighborhoods adjacent to large blocks of open space as um, dictated by our Maryland counterparts. Um, so the first neighborhood we worked at, this is Land, um, Landon's Way and Layton. Um, adjacent to Westwoods here, um, Land Trust. So we identified all these houses in blue and sent letters to them. And we heard back from those houses in pink and the ones with the black background are the ones we ultimately selected to do um, direct intervention as well as mouse trapping. Um, our second neighborhood was, this is the Maple Moppus Round Hill Road neighborhood. This is um, Timberlands here, this is Route 80. Um, and these are our collaborators there. The stars represent those four poster devices we put out for control of deer, which would encompass the whole neighborhood because deer wander through the whole neighborhood regardless of who owns it or not. Um, and our third neighborhood, this is south of Timberland. So this is Timberland's here. This is the North Madison Road, Twin Bridges going up here, um, Pepperbush Willow Road here. Um, I believe this is Elizabeth Road here. And this is, so we had a bunch right along North Madison Road. Four poster device here, four poster device here, four poster device here. Um, neighborhood four, this appears to be Eastgate. So this is sort of in the southeastern part of town. Um, Eastgate, Den Hollow. This is all land trust land, these, these green blocks, the so four poster, four poster, four poster. Um, and then this is our Colonial Road. 
um, Arrowhead, Old Sachem's Head, which wound up being our control. And wouldn't you know it, they had the most ticks and most deer of the entire study. And we weren't very pleased with us that we weren't treating them, but that was the roll of the dice. And um, hopefully we can accommodate these folks into the future, but um, they played a pivotal role in the study as well. Oh, uh, sixth neighborhood. Let's see. This looks like it's Bluff View. This is way up in North Guilford. This is Durham right up here. Um, and this is land trust land here. Blue Hills Road, Bluff View going over here. Neighborhood seven. This is um, the state portion of Timberlands. Um, this is Sawmill Road, Three Corners, um, Ruggles. This is 146 coming through here. This is Lost Lake down here. Um, anyhow, so we were scattered throughout town and we had lots of cooperators, lots of people were very great with allowing us in their properties, getting to know their dogs and their and their pools made us very jealous on those hot August days. But um, we we're very appreciative to those folks for allowing us access to their properties and allowing us to do these various interventions. And it was great, they were very appreciative. Um, they were getting free tick control and permitted us to slog all over their properties doing our various sampling regimes. So um, we put 10 of those rodent bait boxes at each of the nine properties and then each of the six treatment neighborhoods for a total of 540 boxes each deployment. And then we bought a 100 gallon spray rig here and we applied the um, MET 52 ourselves and it was about a thousand gallons per treatment at the 36 houses to receive this treatment in the in the spring when that nymphal cohort was active, 2018, 2019, and 2020. So because we were able to do this ourselves, my colleague Mike and I are um, licensed pesticide, pesticide applicators. So that saved a lot of money and gave us some freedom um, to do this as we needed to and, and see fit. Um, as I mentioned, these four posters were distributed um, to limit some of those dominance issues, we only put 50 pounds of corn in each week. So the deer knew they had to get there quick, consume the corn, get treated, and then, um, you know, they were empty for a little bit and some of the subordinate animals would go back and poke their heads in and look to see if there was any corn and get treated with the pesticide, which was the intent not to feed the deer. Um, <laughs> and you can see, uh, this book got displeased with it being empty and, and wound up pawing it over and knocking it over. So, um, and then we sampled for ticks at the various houses. And all we did for that is just drag this cloth behind us along transects of known distance. So we can compare densities between them. And um, this is my colleague, Mike, demonstrating how we did it. But I have to say that Heidi and her crew did all the um, all the work with the neighborhoods, and, which was invaluable. And we sampled each of those 80 something houses on eight occasions per year. So it's no small task to get these done. Um, and the NIMS were sent to CDC to, for testing for pathogen presence. Um, hey, hey, knock it off. Um, and we were able to determine nymphal density and infection status um, of these with the help from the CDC. And as I mentioned, the rodents, that was where I came in with my crew was doing um, the rodent trapping. Um, they carry the, the reservoirs for the various pathogens. So they reside within these guys. So here you can see what looks like a nymphal, um, black like a tick engorged on the ear of this mouse. But um, we trapped them late May through September. And we put out 12 traps for house. Um, and once we had them in hand, we knock them out for about a minute or so with an inhalant anesthetic and we're able to take, put in an ear tag, um, take a blood sample and an ear tissue sample. We weigh them, we quantify tick load and, and sample some of these engorged ticks like that's pictured here. And we release the non-targets like chipmunks and so forth. Um, and we trapped each of the 63 homes um, uh, four times in 2017, 2019, five times in 2020, and we're currently in um, trapping them now. So this is just, you know, what, where we did the tick dragging over the four years, not including this year, we've sampled over 60 acres in tick dragging. 
We've got nearly 800 nymphal black-legged ticks, um, and we've captured, you know, almost 1,600 unique mice on 2,200 occasions. So it's no small effort here. Our sample sizes are pretty big, pretty impressive, pretty, um, you know, pretty good, decent um, amount of work to get, to get these samples. Um, and people always get a kick out of this. So clearly we're targeting the mice and about 85% or so of our captures are those white-footed mice, which are the target for the ticks and the pathogens. But we always get some bycatch. Chipmunks too are, are, are play a role, but they're not as numerous as the mice. And over the four years of trapping thus far, we got 350 captures of those and we just sort of note them and, and let them go. Um, Northern short-tailed shrew, uh, we got 42 or so of these guys. And unfortunately, these guys have a, a super metabolism and they need to eat um, pretty readily. So unfortunately, um, some of the ones in our traps didn't make it and were and perished in them as a result of our sampling because they weren't able to eat, but that was unfortunate. Um, house wren is a curious sort of ground dweller. We've got nine of those, which just, just saw the trap and hopped in and set it off and get captured, which is always a surprise when you're looking in there. Uh, meadow voles, these are the um, herbivorous guys who girdle your plants under the snow and drive gardeners crazy. We've got about eight of those. Five gray squirrels, two flying squirrels, which are very cute and curious and have huge eyes as they're largely nocturnal. Three ermine, which is a, a weasel, a very um, aggressive predator. If you're a squirrel or a chipmunk, these weasels are, and have, um, grow white fur in the winter and then they turn brown in the spring and summer. And actually one of the ones we got, I think it was over in the Eastgate neighborhood popped out and it had gone in a trap that a chipmunk had gone in and was feasting on the chipmunk um, and we released it. Uh, we got one toad who must've just stumbled in there accidentally, a garter snake and a wolf frog. Um, also we got one small possum and one bunny. So um, just kind of fun to see some of the other stuff that we capture, but like 85 to 90% of our captures are those white-footed mice, which are so pivotal to this project. So this is the mean number of ticks that were parasitizing each one of our captured mice in our control neighborhood. We had 4.2 and where we had the bait boxes and met 52 and our various treatments, you could see how much lower it was. But um, so we were very excited when we saw this, but unfortunately that was from the baseline year where we hadn't even put the treatments out. We had just designated treatments and hadn't, hadn't done any treating whatsoever. So that was a little frustrating that there was so much variation and um, our, our control neighborhood had so many ticks. But then this is that the, those same numbers here. And then you can see over the years that this is the control neighborhood that the abundances were growing pretty substantially for whatever reason, for environmental reasons, and then plunged here in the control neighborhoods, but while we see this growth in the control neighborhoods, we weren't seeing similar growth where we start in the neighborhoods we were treating in 2018 and 19 and 20. So it was growing in the control neighborhoods, but we were driving abundances down in the neighborhoods we were treating. And so that was good, but a little tricky to tease this out with the statistics. Again, this is the number of ticks parasitizing the mice we captured. So we have the mice in hand and count them and, and quantify that. Um, and we had to assume that, you know, if we were seeing that growth in those control sites that we would have experienced that same growth at our treatment sites. Um, and it's a fairly safe assumption given that all the treatment sites are, are in the same town and, and basically the same, for the most part, the same weather and same temperature conditions and so forth. So. We would have to assume that you know those, that second year we'd have a 100% increase in our in our treatment neighborhoods had we not done anything, um, and so but to standardize this we could look at percent change um, for each year as compared to the baseline for each treatment. So because we couldn't look at the differences directly, we had to look at percent change, and that's I'm going to get a little mathy here. Hopefully you can follow along again. I'm, talking to my screen so I can't see any confused looks on coming back at me, but this is um, percent change relative to that baseline year. So in the year two, the control grew 95% as compared to the previous year, the first year, 
and where we treated with bait box and met 52, it only grew 10%. And where we had the four poster and bait box, we, we, it actually declined 39% compared to the previous year. And where we had all three in combination, it actually declined 83%. So where it grew nearly double, where we did nothing, it declined nearly in half where we had all three treatments in, in, in combination. So in year two on the control, you can see it grew 134% as compared to that baseline year. For your 17% where we had these two in combination declined 58% and 20% here. Ultimately, what we really care about is this last year um, where for some reason the control population declined 22% as compared to that baseline year. And we had the 92, 88, and 96 percent declines at our other ones. So we were having success. We were driving numbers down as compared to control. We just weren't seeing the same amount of growth as we were seeing where we were doing nothing. We we're getting great feedback from collaborators and neighbors and, and and people saying, you know, we just don't have the ticks we used to. We're not seeing them on the dogs, and we were getting great feedback from, from them. So our treatments were working. Um, they all work pretty equally. We couldn't really see, you know, some of these, maybe the four poster and bait box and, and all three in combination here were working better than this bait box met 52 combination. Um, but for the most part, they were all working equally. Um, I'm going to skip that. And then this is the percent of mouse captures that were infected with Borrelia, the causal agent of Lyme disease. So this is the control for years, baseline year, year one, year two, year three. So again, with that third year, we saw this drop for some reason in, in ticks and infection where we did nothing, but it had been holding steady where 50% of the mice were infected with it. Um, and we see precipitous drops here in the areas we treat down to 9% versus 32% in that third year, 11%. And six percent. So not only were we effective in, in retarding tick growth, but we were also effective in driving down um, infection with the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. That's the most prevalent. And here, this went down dramatically and substantially after the second year. Um, and with lesser tick abundance, you're going to see lesser infections. So they kind of go hand in hand. And um, these, these letters here, sorry, represent significant differences. So if the letters are the same, there is not a significant difference. But if the letters are different, there's a statistically significant difference. So um, these three years here were statistically dis lower than they were when we started out the project. So that was good news. Um, and then what was surprising, I mentioned Babesia and the growing rates of Babesia microti in, in the mice. And that was kind of surprising that levels were so high in the mice here in Guilford. Um, some of them were higher than Borrelia, which is hard to believe. Um, so we feel like um, Babesia might be the new emerging one and following that same trajectory that um, Borrelia followed where we're sort of the focal point for it now. And we're seeing these increased rates in it and it's gonna radiate out from sort of central Connecticut through the rest of the Northeast and mid-Atlantic. And we're gonna have, um, this is gonna be the new one. As I mentioned, this is a protozoan parasite. So if you're diagnosed with a tick-borne illness, people typically just say, take some doxycycline and you'll be fine um, because that's an antibiotic, but this is not um, a bacteria, this is a protozoan. So again, you need to diagnose that this is in fact Babesia and then take, um, a comparable drug to uh, anti-malarial drug to handle this, this pathogen. So this is of concern because it could potentially be misdiagnosed and the cure isn't as simple as just taking an antibiotic. So this is something to look for. But again, our treatments were able to drive infection with this down similarly as it was with um, the Borrelia cohort. Um, this is just another pathogen, same sort of life cycle, same sort of reservoir and vector host. Um, was it, and we were able to successfully drive that down. Um, I don't want to skip over that. So, so the take home message here was things were a little bit murky um, because we had that control cohort that was so high and because our uh, host seeking ticks that I just skipped over, those results weren't very clear. And I don't feel like 
getting into those now as I'm getting long enough time here. Um, it could be weather related. It could, um, well, and it could be deer abundance related. There are a lot of deer down at in Colonial and Sachem's Headway. Um, and that could be driving tick abundances up and, and as opposed to the rest of town where there may be more hunting, more collisions with vehicles that are keeping the deer at bay versus Sachem's Head. Um, it's difficult to detect tick reduction in both the host seeking and parasitizing populations. Um, but Borrelia reduction in mice in all three treatments was definitely promising, as was the Babesia, which was surprising and which is going to sort of drive the, the results here of our study, and which is of interest, was that those um, infection rates were so high and that we were able to have some control over them. And now we're doing some trapping and, and sampling, and we're hoping, um, we're not doing any more treatments, but we're hoping that there's some leftover control from previous years and hopefully we're going to see things level out be able to explain explain them more um, and at this point I just want to thank our, our supervisor Dr. Kirby Stafford who's the tick guy in the state um, entomologist in Connecticut my colleague uh, Megan who's been a, a great help uh, my colleague Mike Short Heidi Stuber Jamie Cantoni and this dog who was apparently peeing on our four poster and this is uh, Mike and I on our four poster devices. Um, anyhow, I'm very local. I live in town. I am a public servant. If you have any questions on ticks or if you have a tick feeding on yourself or if you just have any questions related to this sort of thing that I can help um, assuage, please get in touch with me. I'm, pretty active on Facebook. I'm also, you know, at scott.williams at ct.gov and Janet and Kevin and these folks know how to get in touch with me. So um, please do get in touch with me. Um, and I'm not, I guess we can do questions now. I'm not sure how this is going to go, but are you okay. going to feed them to me, Kevin, or how's this going to work? I'll try feeding them to you, Scott, there. Okay. So right now we have three that came up so far. Um, one came from the beginning of the program there. Um, how many blood meals are required for each life stage of a tick? In other words, do they repeatedly feed during the period of time they are looking for a blood meal? If so, how many meals a week? Thanks. Oh, okay, so um, ticks only require one blood meal for each life stage. So as larvae, they need to feed once and feed to completion and then they fall off and they molt into nymphs, and then the nymphs require another blood meal, and they feed to completion, fall off, then molt and become adults, which fall off. Hopefully, well, not hopefully, ultimately are trying to complete their blood meal, and they mate, and then um, fall off, and the females lay eggs. So it's all, for each stage, they only require one blood meal, but um, because it's a three-host tick, so they fall off, as each stage and have to acquire a new host. So you can imagine, you know, larvae are most successful and then they get less successful as their stages, um, as they go on. And, you know, each stage has a, a larger and larger cohort that don't feed and just wind up dying. Um, okay, second one here is, are tick tubes containing the permetrian saturated bedding material effective? Um, so, right, so this is another tool in the tick toolbox. It's basically a toilet paper roll stuffed with cotton soaked in permethrin. And the, and the um, thought here is, is that mice and small rodents will, will take this material and um, will take it back to their dens and use it for bedding material. And in doing so, will treat um, themselves and their young uh, with the permethrin soaked bedding material and kill the ticks on them. It's a great theory and concept and it, it does work and it can work, um, but it's contingent on the amount of other natural bedding material that's available in the area. Um, cedar, just like you'd use in a hamster or rat cage is an excellent bedding material and squirrels and other animals use that naturally readily. Cedar bark and from cedar trees and so forth, also oak leaves. So, if, and that stuff that doesn't decompose as, as readily. So if that stuff's available, they're not gonna use this cotton stuff. Um, but if that is not available, they will use it. So so the answer is yes and no. So yes, they work and, and, and no, they don't. It's kind of dependent. So if you were 
really want to use them, you could litter your property with, you know, 50, 100 of these things, and um, you would likely have some success. Okay, how can treatments be grown to encompass all of Guilford and beyond? Uh, well, that's a good one. We're working on that. So that's sort of instead of a neighbor, like a, a, a backyard treatment, like those bait boxes, obviously, we can't afford to put those out through you know, all 50 square miles of Guilford. Um, but we're working on that now. That's a more area wide approach for animals like deer or treating them. We could kill every deer in Guilford and that would certainly have an effect, but I don't think um, politics and emotion would permit that. Um, but it would have to be at the level of deer and we're working on that now. We're actually working on a project where we're treating deer um, systemically. So we're feeding deer um, treated corn that can kill the ticks um, that feed on them systemically. So hopefully something like that could have a regional wide effect, um, but that is in the works and we're actively researching that. But it would have to be not from the mouse standpoint, it would have to be from a deer standpoint. Okay, are chickens good control for ticks on the yard? Um, yes, we often get chickens, guinea hens and turkeys and so forth as the end all be all for tick control. And sure, they'll eat them, and, um, but a tick is such a nutrient poor um, food source that if a chicken comes across a tick, sure, it'll eat it. If a turkey comes across, if a guinea hen comes across it, sure. But it's such an insignificant meal. It's not like they're seeking them out for any particular reason. Um, so if you have them in your yard, they will eat them and you'll probably notice a reduction, but again, they're not targeting ticks and, and foregoing all other food items and, and honing in on, on ticks. So they will have some effect, but I don't think, I think it's been magnified um, over social media over the past several years. Okay, and are tick boxes available to the general public? Um, unfortunately, they are available to the general public, the answer is yes, but unfortunately you have to purchase them and they have to be distributed by a um, pesticide applicator, like a landscape landscaper or, or, or someone of, of that like of that nature so it has to be hired out because it does contain um, that pesticide so that's kind of a limitation on that. but if people are spraying having landscapers spray their properties this is another sort of longer term solution that they could they could opt for if you don't have deer in your yard does that mean mean you don't really need to worry about ticks slash Lyme disease in the yard? Um, person lives near the green and sees raccoons, foxes, but never deer. No, that's so it's so deer are the main culprit and certainly the major one, but they're not the only one that uh, move ticks around and feed, feed ticks, raccoons, coyotes, turkeys, birds, perching birds, mice, rodents. Um, squirrels, whatever, whatever, you all have ticks on them and all move ticks around. Um, but deer, again, are the, sorry, I got a dog in my lap now. Um, deer are the um, implicated in most of them, but there are plenty of other um, hosts aside from deer in, in downtown areas that you need to worry about. And if one has edible raspberries at the edge of the yard, are there, are there any safe treatments applied to the edge of the yard? Either way, is the best yard treatment for environment if M, the MET, MET 52 is not available? Um, a lot of folks now are opting for cedar oil, which seems to be quite popular with um, landscapers and people and homeowners generally. And the cedar oil is natural. Um, it's good that it, it's environmentally friendly. It keeps ticks at bay. It doesn't kill ticks, but it repels them from the yard. And um, I wouldn't advise spraying them directly on raspberries, but if you if you spray them, raspberries tend to ripen this time of year and we're kind of in dormant season for ticks anyway. So if your um, applicator knows anything about ecology, they won't be charging you to spray this time of year, but rather in the spring and, and in the fall. Um, so, I, I would go with cedar oil or talk to your applicator about that, about options. And if you want further detail, you can always contact me. Okay. Um, 
think this one you already answered. Somebody wrote a different way. I, I sprayed Promethean on cotton balls and let them dry and put them in the toilet paper tube in my yard. Would you say that's a good or effective treatment or worthwhile? Well, that's just you know a home remedy for for those other tubes you could purchase. Um, you could try that; it would have some effectiveness, but I bet it wouldn't weather as well as the commercial ones that probably have a better way of impregnating the product in the cotton. Are natural treatments offered by some commercial companies that involve spray of the perimeter of the property with peppermint oil and other sub substances effective? Yeah, so I just I kind of just covered that. So yeah. the peppermint oil, cedar oil, those things like they are effective. Um, and again, remember those activity peaks I told you about is when you need to spray this stuff and keep them at bay. Um, it's only about a six or week, a six or eight week activity period, um, and you require a couple of treatments of this likely. But like I said, now the dead of summer, like you wouldn't require that treatment because the ticks aren't active now. And they won't be again until you know larvae hatch in August, and then the adults come out in the fall. So there's no need to be treating now, but these various repellents can be effective at those peak um, seasons. So I can come on your property and spray water right now, and you say it works great because you aren't getting ticks, but that's only because the ticks aren't active this time of year. Um, and, that's, and this one here is a follow-up question uh, about the general public can benefit from this. Do you have recommendations on companies that could come and apply some of these treatments and set, set the tick boxes in the MET-52 spray? Um, as a public employee, I'm not supposed to recommend companies. So I, uh, there are numerous ones available and they're all very good. And I would talk to your neighbor and, and other folks about um, some of these companies. Tick boxes, I, I know they're exclusive to Connecticut Tick Control in Norwalk. I know they have the patent on it, but I'm not sure if they give those out to um, sell them to other applicators. Uh, I'm certain they do, but um, but again, this would be more of a word of mouth thing than, than, than coming from, from me. All right, that's all I see for questions here. Um, anybody else have anything else here? Oh, okay. Here's a new one here. Do doctors typically differentiate between, um, assuming between the two um, diseases or vectors? Um, presumably, yeah. So, yes, you can get, I mean, if you're feeling ill and, and if you're not feeling yourself, right? Um, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, if you're not feeling yourself and you're feeling ill and run down in Connecticut, it would seem that tick borne disease illness would be sort of the first place you go to to, to get checked. And if your doctor is 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 good. He, he or she will will test for these things, and, and there are tests for those three major pathogens I talked about. But we're seeing some other newer ones on the landscape that kind of fly under the radar. Um, but chances are, it's it's either Babesia anaplasma or Borrelia. The testing for them can be somewhat iffy, and it's not exact. But different tests exist for those different pathogens specifically. So. Um, so yes, there are there are tests for those. Um, and I just saw a question pop up about opossums. I was um, I knew that would come up. So uh, opossums do groom and eat ticks, but um, this has been another one since it's been sensationalized on, on social media, um, saving the possums and don't kill the possums, but. Possums have been with us since the start of this Lyme disease epidemic. And if they were going to save us, why has the situation only gotten worse over time? So yes, they do, you know, groom and, and consume some, but they're not, it's not that silver bullet that people want them to be where they're gonna save us from everything. So that's, people want that one, the possums or the Japanese barberry we've worked with or or the deer in, in and in the, the ecology of this is so complex, it's not one of those things. And there isn't just one thing that's gonna solve the problem. Like if we have a million opossums on the, on the ground, it's um, this integrated approach. And if, if there's an absence of deer or an absence of possums, the ticks are just gonna feed on whatever other reservoir is available. So it's, it, it, there isn't the one, um, one silver bullet 
solution to this. It, it's it's an integrated approach and it's sort of a moving target, um, which keeps it interesting and it keeps it frustrating at the same time. Um, but there are steps we can take that can that can reduce these numbers in infection over time. Okay, another one that says it may not be your specialty, but why is there a Lyme vaccine for dogs and not humans? Mm -hmm. I believe there used to be one because I had one yeah, no, that's, a few that's, years that's, ago. That's not my specialty, but there is uh, there was one years ago, and I, I, the hype it was just it worked it worked well um but the hype and the the mystery behind the Lyme disease brought it down and people were saying it gave you Lyme disease and all this so the people the company just pulled the plug and wasn't worth all the misinformation that was happening and um to get one retested and recertified or whatever is extremely expensive and I think there's one a French um, company now that's in the later stages, later trials of one that, that may be out within a year or two. Um, and like you say, it's available for our pets, but our pets don't have lawyers and, and Facebook and Twitter. So, um, so that the, it, it works well for them, but you know, where we make up our own science, sometimes it, it doesn't work as well for us. Okay, any more questions? Again, this thank you guys, thank you for doing this and thank you for listening to those of you out there. And again, it's just an awkward format, but again, I encourage you to please, if you do have any further questions to contact me directly, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. Yes, thanks, Scott. And thanks, Danielle, for the library hosting us. Welcome. Have a good evening, everyone. And Kevin, thanks for doing the, the question. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good Take night. care. Bye. Bye, everybody.